All right. Good morning. morning. Good to see everybody. Welcome to Bethesda Baptist Church. So glad to have everybody with us today. I hope you guys are doing well. And uh, man, we just came back from, Lucinda and I and the fam just came back from vacation and it was so nice. We did miss you guys. Landon did a knockout job. Y'all give it up for Landon. This morning, you guys are going to have a real treat. You guys get to hear from my brother Sandy Marks from the state convention. He's going to knock it out of the ballpark for you guys, and hopefully you guys will be, you guys will be well fed today from the word. And then, so let's jump right into our announcements. First up, we have men's breakfast. So next Sunday at 8 a.m., we will be meeting in the fellowship hall with those nice new floors, and uh, it's going to be so great. So I want to encourage you guys, men, come on out. We're going to feast the fellowship Bring your sons, bring your grandsons. We're going to have a great time over in the fellowship hall, 8 a.m. Put it on your calendars. Hold on a second, better yet. Wives, please remind your husbands on Saturday night to be in the fellowship hall for breakfast, okay? So with all that, our next two announcements, we're going to hear from Miss Jackie Arlington. There we go. Hey, everybody. Um, so we have some really exciting stuff coming up with our... Um, as we're finishing up our summer, we're going to be getting ready for our fall activities. Um, Awana will be starting up again, which is so much fun. Um, so we will have our Awana and our Sunday morning volunteer training. Um, that will happen on Saturday, August 10th at 10 o'clock. That'll be right here in the worship center. We'll um, do our our Sunday morning volunteer training first, and then we will go ahead and do our WANA training. There'll be some brunch, so if you'd like to volunteer and you'd like to eat, please come out on Saturday the 10th. And then, with that, AWANA will be starting on August 21st, and that will be each Wednesday um, from 6.30 to 7.45. It'll be for grades, uh, well, actually from ages three to fifth grade, and it's a great time. The kids absolutely love it, so um, you can register in your bulletin, and we would love to have you out. Well, thank you, Jackie. So as we, uh, as we enter into worship today, let's say uh, a word of prayer, and then uh, let's stand together and let's sing. Uh, dear Lord, we just thank you so much. We thank you that you are mighty and worthy of our praise, that, that, that we, um, again, every week I thank you that we come together um, as brothers and sisters in Christ to praise you, and uh, it is just something that uh, we should not take for granted. Uh, we love you, Lord, um, and I pray that today as we worship you that we would just be able to direct all of our affection to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, well, let's stand together and let's sing. Started, you'll come. 
I believe in you. I believe. Eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. The Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus.
Man, the sound's the best part on that. feeling that electric organ on that. That's just dope. All right. Good to see everybody today. Man, y'all, again, y'all are in for a real special treat this morning. My buddy Sandy Marks. Come on up, Sandy. Sandy is a pastoral strategist for the NC Baptist. He is a, an expert fisherman. Um, you know, yeah. so Sandy, uh, Sandy has been really super helpful to me in my time here in North Carolina as a pastor and, and has been a good friend, especially Dude, help me find my kayak, y'all. Um, so, so that's a special place in my heart. Um, yeah, that's so, right. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Y'all, y'all sit back and enjoy. Oh, man, I'm glad to be here. I could have done without the wheel with the, he got the moves going on there. I, w- I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, but uh, it is good to be with you. Good morning. Uh, and Landon, what a great job you guys did at leading us in worship this morning. Isn't that great? This I tell you, I'm in a lot of churches and a lot of worship experiences, and let me just say this uh, this way. You guys are blessed. Amen? <laughs> I, I to have those guys here leading you in worship uh, every morning. Take your Bibles. Turn with me a couple of different places we're going to be. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and Hebrews 13. If you want to go ahead and turn there, while you're doing that, I want to just say thank you, number one, personally, for the invitation to be here. But secondly, thank you on behalf of North Carolina Baptist. We are so excited about what God is doing here uh, at you guys' location of ministry and how the Lord is using you and your emphasis on making disciples locally. Man, some of the things that are happening here are just tremendous. And also across the nations to know, you know, just in a few days, you got a group that are going to Brazil. We just praise the Lord for that. You know, we really are uh, just delighted that you are part of us, North Carolina Baptists, because we really do believe uh, that God is calling us to be on mission together. And when we're on mission together, uh, the Lord is going to be glorified. And when he's glorified and lifted up, uh, he's going to draw men and women unto him. Amen? Amen. So we're delighted to be in that ministry with you together. Uh, so if you've turned there, uh, I want to just share with you that I'm delighted any time to preach God's word. And I was preparing this week. I was thinking about just how awesome it is that God reveals himself to us. I mean, uh, I'm studying personally and done a, at least one message out of the book of Exodus and how God revealed himself to Moses. You know, you think about it, our God not only desires that we know him, but he desires to reveal his nature and who he is to us. And you think about it, our God is a God of love. You know, the Bible says he is love, in fact, and he embodies that just tremendously. He's also a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. He's a God of forgiveness, and he's a God of judgment. He's a God of wrath. He's he's all of those things, but he also reveals himself to us that he is a God of order. I mean, I mean, think about it. He, he, he's a God of order. We see it all throughout Scripture. Beginning in Genesis, we see that commitment to order in creation. I mean, Genesis 1, we see him creating the universe, everything in it, and just a meticulous order and structure and purpose. And every day, uh, creation is structured in that story, and it's deliberate, and it's calculated, uh, and, and just everything even cultivating in the creation of humanity. We see just the nature of the commitment of God to order. I mean, it reflects several things about him. It reflects his wisdom. It reflects his design. It it reflects his sovereignty over everything, over nature, everything. So we see that commitment. But also then we see it in family. I mean, think about how he's structured the family. You know, he established the family as sort of the fundamental building block of society and of humanity. You know, that's the reason the evil one desires to attack the family in such a way because the family is the foundation on which everything sort of is built. I mean, Ephesians chapter 5, we see him outlining specific roles of the family, responsibilities within the family, the husbands, the wives, the children, the parents, all those things and all those responsibilities are designed to function in harmony because there's great purpose for everybody. There's stability, there's mutual respect, there's 
flourishing of individuals when everyone's carrying out their role within the family. And then we think about it in the church. I mean, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul writes, but all things should be done, what? Decently and in order. And this instruction reflects again God's desire for the church to be operating in a specific way. And, and it, when it operates that way, it, it, it does it in an edifying manner. We see results. You know, the New Testament outlines for us, and you guys have covered all this, roles and responsibilities. And those roles and responsibilities are given for a purpose. They're given for the purpose of, of unity and, and proper use of spiritual gifts. I mean, really... You don't want me singing. You know, you don't want me up here leading the congregation. I'm, I'm that, this afternoon, I'm helping do a funeral for a dear friend of ours. And at the end of it, there was this uh, little piece where there's this doxology that's been to be sung. And I asked my wife sitting on the couch last night, I said, who's leading that? Are we singing that? Are we saying that? And she texted and got the text back. Uh, we're singing that. Could Sandy lead that? And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> no, nobody wants that to happen. So we all have our spiritual gifts. We all have our giftedness. And you don't want me leading the music. It, you know, and so it's all because of God's purpose. And, and it's given to us. This order, order, orderness promotes for us growth. It promotes maturity. It promotes effectiveness. And it promotes us fulfilling the mission. So we see our God is a God of order, and our God is a God of structure, and He's given in such detail because it's paramount for effectiveness. If, if creation isn't orderly, and if creation isn't right as it should be, then, then, I mean, think about it. Creation doesn't sustain itself. We wouldn't be here. And then think about it, even family, if there's not order, if there's not structure. And then when we come to the church, it's the same thing. So here is our assignment today. We're going to look at... When God has ordered and God has structured the congregation for its effectiveness so it can uh, edify one another, so it can be on mission together, what does that look like for us? As members of a congregation, of a local body of believers, how do we relate to those that are leaders of, above us, as Scripture would say? How do we, how do we relate to them practically, practically? What does that look like for us in everyday life? So that's sort of where we're going today. Before we do, let's just offer a prayer to the Lord that he might minister to us through his word today. Father, as we come today, we're so excited to be in this place. Lord, we've already sang songs to your name. We've already glorified you, Lord, through our worship. And now, Lord, as we come to these few moments, Lord, we ask that you use your word, Lord, which is truth, it's without error, Lord, it's alive, it's active. And Lord, we ask that you use your spirit that's not just simply in this place, Father, but is in us. And so our prayer is, Lord, that those two things this morning might work in our lives and might transform us into the people that you would have us to be. For we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So as we get to look, let's jump right in. I want to share a few words with you. Uh, and I'm going to structure my points if you're a note taker very easily. There's going to be a couple of words with each point. And so as I think about what does it look like for me as a church member uh, uh, to function within a congregation, uh, how do I relate to those that are within that body? The first two words I would say to you are respect and love. Respect and love. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 12 and 13. Paul writes this, he says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. You know, as we think about it, we've mentioned it already. When it comes to the church family, just like any other family, the, the leaders are there for a purpose. The leaders are there for a, a reason to maintain the, the order that God has placed there and, and to maintain the order that he has for his bride, the church. And so as the elders and leaders provide this spiritual leadership, there's a certain way that we, as the body of Christ, are to relate to them. And Paul uses some pretty powerful words when he describes that relationship. He describes it that, that we are to respect them. But he doesn't say just respect them, but to esteem them very highly. Now, the Greek word for that very highly is an interesting word because we really lose some of the power in our English phrase. And one source says that this is the highest form of comparison imaginable. 
So we might translate that little phrase this way, esteem them infinitely highly. You know, we don't do that in English. That doesn't make sense in English, but that gives us some indication of how strong that word is there. So, so when we hear that command coupled with the additional thing that Paul says, it could be like this, esteem them highly, infinitely in what? In love. Now, now don't, don't miss that. You see, this morning our esteeming and our respecting isn't just a matter of the head. It's just not something that we sort of do in our mind. It's a matter of the heart. This respect and this, and this uh, esteeming comes out of a love that we have for them. He's saying to hold them in your heart. And as the New Testament teaches, to view them as a gift to us from God. And to love them dearly that labor among you. So the foundation of this relationship that we have for those that are leaders, uh, those that are elders among us, is that we are to have that foundation of love uh, and, and towards them and for them. And I don't know about you, but that really doesn't surprise me because it seems like just about everything that we do as the body of Christ, we are to do it in what? In love, you know, not out of obligation, not out of duty, not out of just this sense of guilt if we don't. Everything in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ and, and moving forward is based out of this love. So when it comes to us and how we relate to those that are leaders, then we come to them with this commitment of love. That's the foundation. So flip over now to Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to be there for the rest of our time. So remember, everything we're doing now is not based out of obligation, not based out of because I told you so. It's based out of we relate to them with this love that we have for them. We esteem them infinitely highly. Second two words. So first ones we had what? To respect and love. And then we say secondly, to love and imitate. To love and imitate. Look at verse 7 of chapter 13, Hebrews. He says, remember your leaders... Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their, word, their way of life and imitate their what? Their faith. You know, we know what that word to remember means. We don't have to delve down into Greek to understand that. It means to keep in mind. It means to think about uh, them and think about their lives. And particularly the call here is to think about how God has worked in their lives. To think about how God has exhibited himself just through the everyday life of our leaders. When we keep, when we remember to keep in mind, this provides a couple of things for us. So when we remember our leaders, we're looking at their lives. And remember, all of this is based out of love. But also, as we're going to talk about in just a little bit, all of this is based out of their commitment to be those men that God has called them to be, Right? And, and they're following and walking in truth. So as we do that, we need to understand there's a couple of things that, that remembering, that paying close attention to their lives does for us. Uh, first of all, we learn from their lives. We learn from, from their lives. We think so often about learning from someone that's a great orator, that's a great teacher. You know, some of the best lessons in life we learn from people that never stand up in front and, and teach, but some of the best lessons in life, we just learn from how people live their lives. I mean, think about it. That's sort of what we're get, getting at here. And notice what it says, observing the what? The outcome of their way of life. So it's paying attention to their faith and how God has shaped their character, how God informs their decisions, how God leads them and how they act and interact with, with those that are around them. So we as, as, as members of a congregation, we're, we're loving our elders, but we're, we, we're learning from their lives as we look and see how they're living their lives and how God's working in their lives. You know, it's there, I think, that we really learn some valuable lessons from their examples. We think about, we learned a lesson of faithfulness. Faithfulness is one of those things that we can talk about and we can read about, but we learn it best when we see it. You know, we, well, that's the reason YouTube is so popular for instructions. I can read a book on how to change a headlight on my car, but it's a whole lot easier when I can watch somebody what? Do it. And so it's the same way with our lives. When we see how their lives 
are, are, are giving into their faithfulness and their perseverance and their obedience to God. So we remember that, we pay attention to that so we can learn from their lives. I think about an influential guy that was in my life. He was the pastor of the first church I served on staff. I was a part-time youth minister. Uh, I didn't know exactly what God was calling me to do, but I knew that God was calling me to do something. And I remember Chris Roten, who was the pastor, and I remember I learned a lot of his, from his preaching and a lot from his teaching. But man, you know what I learned the most from? Just hanging out with him and interacting with him and watching his life and watching how he treated his wife and watching how he treated those that he served as pastor and elder. So we are to remember and, and pay attention because we learn from how they relate to God and how God works in their lives. But there's a second part here. Not only are we to notice that and learn from that, but it goes even further because it says to do what? To imitate their lives and imitate their faith. You know, Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians. You know, it's one of those dangerous st statements. He says, be an imitator of me as I am an imitator of what? Of who? Christ. So, so Paul says that. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So here we have this call not only to remember and pay close attention to their lives and learn from their lives, but now we, we have this call when these godly leaders are following Christ and, and they're, they're living the, 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 the scriptures in their lives, we are called to imitate them. That goes beyond just mere admiration. It encourages us as, as members to apply those principles and those values that those leaders exemplify in our own lives. I don't know about you, but for years before I sort of become a leader, I always had sort of higher standards for leaders than I did of myself. Anybody else do that? And certainly there are biblical evidence for that. But we need to know and understand, we can't just say, well, I can't continue to grow in my relationship because of I'm not a, in this leadership capacity. We should look at their lives and the standard that they live up to, and we could try, strive to imitate that. So we can't just simply say, oh, that's just for the leadership. That should encourage us to do what? To have those same standards for our own lives. I remember I pastored for 25 years before I came to work with our state convention. I remember one guy that was adamant about a change that we were making about our Sunday night worship. I mean, he was really adamant about this, and, and, and uh, he was really upset that this change was being made. But here's the thing that really bothered me. It was about a Sunday night service, and he didn't really come anyway. I mean, he never really was a part of it, but he said, I just think we ought to be doing this. I'm not going to come. It's for you guys to come, but I really don't want to be a part of it myself. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? So it's sort of ridiculous the same way when we say, you know what, our, our, our leadership, we expect this of you, and, and this is what you should be living, this biblical example, and that's great. That's absolutely true, but we shouldn't excuse ourselves from seeking to live up to that same standard. And we should be encouraged and we should be imitating their faith. That same commitment to God that we expect out of our leadership, I think, is expected out of us as followers. So in other words, the high standards we place on those who lead us, we're to begin striving for those same standards in our own lives. So as we think about how to relate, we've seen two things so far. We've seen love and respect, and we've seen learn and imitate but there's a third one, and this is the one that, that you know, people always sort of balk at a little bit, but it's a great freeing passage when you really understand it. The third thing that I would say down in verse 17 is that we're to obey and submit. Look at verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. People cringe at that, and you know, we feel a little funny saying that, but here's the freeing thing about it. I didn't make it up. <laughs> I, I'm just reading it. You know, God give it to us in his word. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now that Greek word there for obey and submit, you know what they mean? They mean obey and submit. 
That's what they mean. They mean obey and submit. But you think about it, there's a little bit of a difference between those two words. And and, and it's just a slight difference, but it makes all the difference. You know, the word uh, uh, implies obedience along with uh, sort of direction and commands. In other words, if, if my son, I ask him to do something, and man, he does it. But the whole time he does it, he's sort of complaining. That probably never happens to you guys, right? You ever ask somebody to do something, and man, it's just a chore. They do it, but they're surely not happy about it. I mean, that's obedience. Obedience is just following a command. That's what obedience is, just doing it, even if it's begrudgingly, even if it's with a bad attitude, even if it's with just complaining the whole time, that's still obedience. But submission goes a little further. Submission is not only doing it, but just sort of doing it with a different attitude. So I think that's what differentiates those two words. We have we're to obey and we have to submit. And, and we can obey outwardly, but inwardly we can be in all, all sorts of turmoil and not submitting at all. And submission implies, I think, this sweet spirit of cooperation that, that this stems out of trust. You know, you trust that the leaders... Have your best interests at heart. You trust that that, that they're following God. You trust that God is leading them and speaking to them. And and you go along with them, not sort of begrudgingly, not hoping that they fail, not hoping that, you know, at the end, this thing really doesn't work out and I can be justified. No, we follow them with this sweet spirit of trust with them because of the love that we have for them as they follow Christ. And the author gives us two reasons why we should obey and submit to our godly leaders. The first one is this. We should obey and submit our godly leaders because they're keeping watch over your souls as they are to give an account to God. Have you ever thought about that phrase? That's, that's the most strenuous thing a part about being a pastor. I mean, it takes time to prepare to preach every week. It takes time to do the hospital visits. It takes time to visit people. It takes time to provide vision and all of those things. But you know what? I believe the most demanding thing for an elder is to know that you're keeping watch over someone's soul. That's one of those things that you just can't just can't feel unless you're there. When you read God's word, it says you're to keep watch over someone's soul. And then the rest of that phrase that says not only are you to keep watch over their souls, but you're going to give them a what? An account of that. You know, out of 25 years as a pastor, I believe that's the most demanding part of being an elder, being a leader, is to know that you're responsible for the souls of people. That's an amazing responsibility. And not only are you given that responsibility, but then you're going to be held accountable for that. You know, so he, he's placed these various levels of authority, all of it under his ultimate authority. And the purpose for all of that authority, remember, is to protect, bless under that authority. I mean, he establishes even the authority of civil government. I mean, God established that. Why did he establish that? To protect and bless citizens from those that would harm us or take advantage of us. I mean, when the government does its job, criminals are punished. Uh, when the government does their job, the foreign invader, invaders are kept at bay and, and people can live and dwell in peace. But to the extent that the government leaders are corrupt or negligent, the citizens suffer. You see that? You see how that functions? Same thing in the family. God appoints the husband to have authority under Christ. Always remember that. It's not his own authority. He's under the authority of Christ to protect and bless the family. I mean, the husband's to provide for the family, protect the family. Physical danger, spiritual danger. And he's to bless the family by leading them where? In the ways of God. So the ungodly husband who uses authority for his own selfish end is actually abusing the authority of God that's entrusted to him. And guess what? He will answer for that. You know, there's going to be a price to pay for that. Now, when we take that in down into the church, God has appointed elders. He's appointed pastors, leaders, shepherds to oversee the flock. But Scripture tells us they're not to lord over the church but rather to be those examples to the flock. 
It's important to see this. On every level, those in authority never have absolute authority. Those in authority, every leader is under the authority of God, and every leader will give an account to God for his leadership. And so, in our text, leaders, notice this, is what? Any English people? Leaders is plural. You know, I'm not an English genius, but it's got an S on the end. That's pretty obvious. You know, so that's a plural thing there. The New Testament, I believe, is clear that there's this plurality of, of elders that watch over the local church, and there's a reason for that. Because plural leadership is a safeguard against abu abuse of what? Authority. And, and so that's a gift to the church. When all the elders in a local congregation have wrestled through an issue biblically and, 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 and ministry focused wise and in prayer and they all agree that they're not infallible by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a pretty good chance that they are walking in the right direction. Now in Acts 15 we see there's always room for biblical based discussion, but when elders come to a consensus the church follows their leadership unless it's contrary to Scripture. And then that also gives us ways to handle that when we find it that way. So also the text is clear that the church should submit to godly leaders. Did you catch that? There's a, there's a part of that. Godly leaders, abusive leaders, they're, they're confronted in Scripture. So we see all of that laid out for us. So we have this submission, we have this obeying, but before we leave there, you know, let me make it more specific on what it does and doesn't mean. First of all, it doesn't mean that we blindly following leaders without question. That's not what it means. I mean, those of you that are old enough, you remember back in the 70s, uh, a guy by the name of Jim Jones and the incident that happened there, you had a leader that was a complete authority. Anybody old enough to remember all that? The massive suicide. You had a guy that abused authority. He had absolute authority. We're not talking about following blindly. So when the church, so when is a church responsible to obey and submit? Obviously, it's when the leaders teach and lead in a godly way, in God's truth. Especially when it comes to the point of, of essential doctrines and, and commands of the faith. We are to submit to their leadership. Because ultimately, it's not the leader's or the elder's authority that we're following. Ultimately, whose authority are we following? God's authority. You see, you see how it is? Just like in creation, just like in family, just like in church, there's an order of authority set up in order that it might function. So we see, obey godly leaders because they keep watch over your souls. But next, we should obey godly leaders because... If you cause them grief, then you cause yourself grief. <laughs> I mean, look what it says. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Let them do this with what? With joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You know, our text states that obedience to godly leaders is for our benefit as church members. Disobedience to them would, would bring about no advantage to us. Now remember the thing we said at the very beginning. God designed authority to what? To protect and bless. And if we disobey godly leaders who proclaim God's word to us and walk in godly ways, then we're ultimately disobeying God. And there's always serious consequences when we ultimately disobey God. And again, it's implicit that these leaders are, are conscientious men who are walking with who? Walking with God in their life. So everything builds on that. So notice what the writer mentions, groaning. <laughs> that, that's an odd word, isn't it? Groaning. You know, think about it in this way. Spiritual children, like natural children, can be a sense or a source of immense joy or immense grief. Can a parent say amen? Nobody can bring you joy like your child. Nobody can bring you groaning like who? Your child. Uh, and, and, and so we see it. Every pastor has, has the occasion for both joy and groaning when we shepherd the flock. You know, Paul rejoiced 
every time he thought about the Thessalonians. But man, he agonized every time he thought about the Galatians. <laughs> you, you remember that relationship there? And, and so we think about it. And in our relationship to our elders, we need to be living in such a way that we're allowing them to serve the Lord with joy, not causing grief, not causing heartache in their lives. You know, it's important to understand this. Paul was not concerned about his own welfare, his own reputation, but he was concerned about the welfare of the church. And he was concerned about the welfare and the glory of God. If, if we cause our, our elders to groan, it's because uh, they know our disobedience will damage both us as well as the name of Christ, which is the big issue. So you should obey godly leaders because they keep watch over your soul. You should obey godly leaders but because actually causing grief to them actually causes grief to us in our own lives. Here's the fourth thing. The last two words are very creative. Pray and pray. Pray and pray. You want to know how to relate to your leadership? Pray. Uh, look at verse 18. Pray for us. You, you can hear the writer just pouring out in those three little words. Pray for us. What do you want us to pray for you about? Well, pray that we are sure we have a clear conscience, desiring to be to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. So he said, pray for us. As I read that, I was beginning to think about in my own mind the Apostle Paul, and I just think, how many times did Paul actually ask people to pray for him? I mean, just a few. I mean, you got Romans chapter 15, verse 30, he asked them to pray for him. I mean, Ephesians chapter 6, he asked for prayer. Colossians chapter 4, Paul asked for prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, he asked for prayer. 2 Thessalonians, he asked for prayer. The book of Philemon, he asked for prayer. There are probably other texts where Paul asked for prayer. And I sit there in my office thinking about that. If Paul was that aware of his need for people to be praying for him, then how much more should the rest of us that are seeking to serve the Lord be asking and needing people to pray for us? Especially in our culture, to discern God's way forward as a congregation in a culture that has so many voices and, and so many pressures coming from so many different directions, there's a huge pressure to hear that voice of God and know when to step out and be the gospel to folks and know when we can just sort of uh, go in a different way but not, but not altering the word of God in any kind of way because, listen, we don't want to be offensive to a lost and broken world, but we want to be biblical. Amen? So charting a course forward is it's just a tremendous task for us. So pray. And then the second part of that point is pray. Then our author here mentions two areas to pray. First of all, he says, pray for leaders in the battle to maintain a good conscience in all things. You know, we have to sort of take an educated guess about what's behind that. We don't, we don't know for 100% who the author is. We don't know, you know what exactly is going on, but we can read between the lines a little bit of that comment there in verse 18, but it seems to be something like this. It seems to be that the author has had to say some difficult things because remember the purpose of Hebrews. He's writing to probably second-generation Jews who are considering going back to the traditional way of living their life as Jews. And, you know, they, they, they've lived for Christ. They're encountering this persecution. Things aren't going as great as they thought it would be so they're considering going back to all these other ways and so the writers had to say some difficult things to them and and I think that's a part of what he's what he's getting at here he says you know you can't go back to Judaism or, or you can't sort of try to blend Christ into Judaism because you're going to face God's judgment if you begin to dilute the gospel so I think that's sort of what he was getting at and every pastor and every elder who's faithful to God has to say or do some things from time to time that ultimately is going to offend somebody within the church it just happens but here we see it happen to this Hebrew writer and listen we know that it's not his heart you know pastor for 25 years you know how many times I've heard we've never done it that way before quite a few But 
the writer is saying to pray for your leaders as they stand firm and maintain a good conscience before God. So he says to pray for us that we might what? That we might be what? Have a clear conscience in all things. Man, your leadership is faced with so many questions, so many opportunities, so many directions. Where do we invest? How do we invest? How do we go about it? How do we do the ministry? Where do we do the ministry? Who do we use to do the ministry? There's so many questions, and the prayer for this leader is, hey, Lord, just allow me to make good decisions and allow me to have a clear conscience about all of these things that we have to decide because there's so much pressure, and ultimately as we make decisions, Just any decision, it doesn't matter whether to have scrambled eggs or fried eggs, somebody's going to be offended at some point in the conversation. So allow me, he says, pray for me, that I can be sure, that I can stand firm in what I believe you're leading us to be. So first he says, pray for them as they maintain that good conscience in all things. And secondly, I think we pray for leaders to be delivered from circumstances or difficulties that are beyond their control. He says this, he said, I urge you more earnestly to do this in order that I may be what? Restored to you sooner. He asked them to pray that he be restored to them sooner. And we don't know the situation that kept him from visiting him, but it was beyond his control. It could have been health problems. It could have been something else. Perhaps his uh, his critics in the Hebrew church there were saying, you know what, if he really cared about you, he would already be back here. He would have already visited you. But there's things going on in his life that are beyond his control. And his request shows that God is bigger than, than any circumstance we face. Amen? Anything we face as the church, God is bigger. You know, any decision that we face in church, God is bigger than all of those things. And prayer then is a means by which of laying hold of God's power. Church, don't miss this. Whatever problem you face as a congregation, whether it's at a crossroads of a decision, the the, the path forward is always bathed in prayer because it's through prayer that we discover the power of God and we gain that access. So power, the prayer is not just a polite gesture that shows that we you know, care about somebody. God has ordained prayer as the one of ways that he pours out his power on his people. So praying for leadership, it, prayer shows that That we're not competent people who just need a little boost from God. We're not people that have ministry figured out. We're not leaders that understand everything about ministry. And we just need a little God sprinkled in here every now and then. We're saying we are desperately inadequate. And we desperately need God's leadership. And we get that through prayer. You know, I think if we prayed regularly for our pastors and elders, uh, maybe there would be fewer elders and that are actually leaving ministry and so discouraged. And that's what I do with our state convention. I work with pastors that uh, they're discouraged. They're at a place of, of wondering what's next for them. I work with pastors after pastors that find themselves in difficult situations and they don't know what the next day's going to hold for them. Do you know, the majority of pastors and elders that enter into ministry don't make five years. Because they become so discouraged and overwhelmed. And I just think if we prayed for our leaders, we would see less of that. So, we've had conversations about how do we relate? What does it look like? So we got to sort of land this plane. The next question, I think, is why? Sandy, you've said some hard things to us. You said to love and respect. You said submit and obey. You said learn and imitate. You said some difficult things to us today. Why is that such an important thing? Why is God so specific at laying all of that out within his word? Well, just very quickly, four things I want to say to you to sort of wrap it up. Four quick reasons. Number one, it reflects his character. 
It reflects his character. Order, structure reflects God's character. You know, God is characterized, as we said earlier, by perfection, by wisdom, by sovereignty. And order then is a natural expression of his nature, ensuring that everything, including his body, functions well according to his divine purpose and plan. Never lose sight of that, that God has a plan and a purpose for your congregation. You know, we often get to think that we get to make that up. We get to discover that. We get to come up with God's plan or God's vision for our church. You know, God discovers that. God declares that. He has a purpose. He has a plan. And so when we understand that order, we reflect His character. But secondly, it protects harmony and growth. You know, order and creation, the family, the church, all of it fosters harmony clarity, effective functioning. If there's not order, if they're not structured, then what happens? There's chaos, there's confusion. And I worked construction for a while, and I, re I remember we always had a very clear cut statement about who was in charge. Those of you that are in the military, there's never any doubt about who was in charge. Why is that true? Because not everybody's in charge. And that creates chaos on a job site. So it prevents chaos. It prevents confusion. It allows individuals as well as communities of faith to thrive and fulfill their intended goal. Number three, it provides stability and security. You know, living within God's design brings stability. It brings uh, security. It does this by producing boundaries. It does this by declaring roles. It does this by having responsibilities that protect individuals and also promote their well-being. And then lastly and most importantly, and I'll close with this one, why is order such a big deal to God? Because it glorifies Him. You know, ultimately, God's commitment to order reflects his glory. When, when the creation operates the way it should, and man, you find yourself uh, maybe at the, at, the, at the beach somewhere, and you're sitting there in the evening when that sun's going down, and you just see how everything works perfectly together. All of creation, you know, we could go into the whole science of how if just the tilt of the earth were off one degree, what a tragedy it would be. And, and when you sit there and watch that beautiful sunset, then you can know and understand that God is glorified because everything is what? Everything is doing its part. And in the family, it's the same thing. When, when you see a family that's committed to the purpose of God and everybody's living into their roles and everybody's glorifying God, we see that perfect picture of God's glory. And the same thing within the church. It glorifies God when a church functions the way it should. As a broken world sees the body of Christ that does everything that it does, not out of obligation, not out of duty, but out of love. A love for God and a love for them. And when our broken world sees that, God is glorified. And when God is glorified, He's lifted up then all men and women are brought unto Him. So maybe as we close this morning, maybe our commitment to Him is just to, first of all, maybe here this morning, and, and that first area of obedience and submission is maybe to the gospel. You know, maybe there's someone here today that's never really uh, submitted their self to Christ. You know, maybe there's someone here today that has never surrendered their life completely to Christ. And maybe today's the day do you come to an altar or you speak to, to Will or Landon, you speak to someone and, and, and you just walk through what it looks like to surrender your life to Christ. Or maybe as we close, you just want to come and say, Lord, we know you have a great plan for us. And Lord, I know that I play a part in that. Every member, everybody sitting in this room and those that are not here today, everybody plays a part in what God has for this church. And maybe the commitment today is, Lord, let me do my part well. Let me know my part. Let me live into my part well that you might be glorified and that our community might be reached and that the nations might be reached.
I hope your vision is big enough not to just include Johnston County, but I hope your vision is big enough to know that you can make impact not just here, but around the globe with your ministry here. So whatever your decision today, altar's open. You respond as the Lord would lead you. Stand together, let's sing. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great I know you will do it again for your promise is yes and amen you will do great things God you do great things oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh God you have done great Our Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Let's sing together, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. God, you do great. be seated. All right, all right. There he is. There's Mixed Master Masters. That didn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Um, I was just excited that you were coming up to do our missions moment. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So 
The missions moment for this week, we've got the Brazil trip coming up. We're going we're gonna to pray for them next week and commission them next week, but we heard Mr. Marks talk about prayer this morning quite a bit and how significant and important that is. Uh, prayer is not just a polite gesture he talked about. We, God requires it to pour out his power and love on his people, and we know that God has a plan for our congregation. He talked a little bit about that. So this week, as you go throughout your week and you pray, pray daily for this team as they prepare to leave the comfort of their homes and their life here to travel to Brazil to share the message of Jesus. Uh, pray that their time there, that he uses them and according to their will, and that we might be the vessel, our church might be the vessel that pro provides true conversion in that area that just allows for his, his message to spread throughout that country and that continent, frankly. So that's the mission moment this week. Take it seriously and uh, pray that God provides. That's it. That's it. And so, as always, I want to encourage you guys, as we, have, as we talk about every week, about this worship through your giving thing. And so I want, again, want to come back and encourage you to worship through your giving. That don't just give. Don't give out of reluctance or obligation. Don't give because you have to. It needs to be an act of worship between you and God. And so if it's out of reluctance or obligation, keep it. But if it's at this idea that you're partnering with us in the work to expand God's kingdom and reach people with the good news, and that's partly what this Brazil trip is about. And so you guys have, have helped to get this team to Brazil to be able to share the gospel and make disciples. And so thank you guys so much for what you're doing, but let's keep it going. This isn't about keeping the lights on. This is about expanding the kingdom. So I want to encourage you, if God's working in you in that, and you want to worship through your giving, you can drop something in the boxes in the back, or you can give online at BethesdaClayton.com slash give. And so, man, I'm going to tell you, Sandy, thank you so much for that message this morning. That was awesome. Um, and, and I know that Lana and I would definitely covet your prayers as we strive to live lives worth imitating. That is a heavy, heavy mantle. So, um, again, we appreciate and love you guys. Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Dear Jesus, we love you. We thank you, and we praise you. Lord God, as we go out, I pray that you would just give us the the wisdom and the words and the opportunities to speak your love and truth to those who have never heard. God, that you would expand your kingdom through us as we try to reach people and love them and serve them uh, through your power and through your grace and your mercy. We love you, Jesus. We praise you and we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great week.